Thank you very much, Tria. I'm now going to ask Eric to uh, talk to us. Eric is a transportation planner and environmental co consultant. He co-authored reports on transportation for the Climate Justice Project. He's also on the steering committee of the Vancouver Burnaby chapter of the Council of Canadians. And he recently broke his ankle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to start off by, um, uh, by just thinking about a little bit about the, the title of this, the, of this um, uh, what I'm going to talk about is transportation system change. But I want to put this, I want you to think about this in terms of the transportation system change as just being one part of the change that we really need to make. Um, and one of the things I'm feeling very good about is that uh, just in the last few months, uh, the, the the slogan, system change, not climate change, has actually come to the fore in um, what groups are doing, fighting against things like the tar sands um, and the pipeline expansion, the tankers. Uh, the Council of Canadians started off with the systemchange.ca project just a few months ago. Occupy Vancouver is um, working on, is using system change, not climate change, as you can see from the banner behind us, is one of the main slogans. And I understand today, I wasn't there because I broke my ankle, um, but I understand that some of the high school students um, were carrying system change, not climate change banners today in the march. And that's, um, I think that's a change in the kind of thinking that we really need to make about what we're fighting for even more than what we're fighting against. Um, so I want to kind of start off with kind of a, a little bit of a, um, of a diversion from what Tree was talking about um, because the fact is is that the big problem we have is not, it isn't actually the oil spills into the water, the ones that don't get out of the pipe. It's like like shown in this satirical news story, the real tragedy is that so much oil is making it through the refineries and being burnt and destabilizing our climate. And um, actually, I also wanted to thank you, Tria, for mentioning future generations because I think that the future generations that really need to be afraid about um, climate change, about global warming, are really people. Um, the future generations, as in people under 50, are the people that need to be shit scared right now. Shit. <laughs> um, it's, not the, it's not the cute little five-year-olds. It's like, it's people under 50 who need to be really concerned. If you're 70 and you're living in Canada and you're middle class, you're probably okay. Probably mostly okay. Um, but if you're 40, um, you should be concerned about, don't be worrying about your kids, be worrying about your own ass. Um, because there's people already all over the world who tonight are not living in their homes. They're in refugee camps. Well, they're not called refugee camps. They're just, because most of them are displaced in their own countries. They're still, um, uh, I, th I think in Pakistan there's still over a million people out of it that haven't that are still homeless because of the floods in 2010. Um, East Africa, well this is labeled 2011, but you could really label it the last 10 years. Um, the whole Sahel re region of Africa, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, the, the old normal of rainfall patterns has ceased to exist and drought is the new normal condition. And if you're a farmer and drought becomes a new normal condition, you move or you die. So I'm actually not too worried about the, the otters that are going to get oil covered or any of that stuff or the birds or all that. I'm really concerned about one species that is dependent on the same Mother Earth that all the other species depend on. So. We've heard of where 
where the fracking gas comes from that is feeding the tar sands and heard about some of the consequences of the tar sands, including the global warming. But I'd actually like to talk about where that, all that tar sands oil is going to. And this, this graph is from the United States, but um, the story is very much the same in Canada. Almost all the oil, or a very, very big percentage of it, goes to cars, trucks, and airplanes. And a big percentage of what doesn't go to cars, trucks, and airplanes directly into their fuel tanks goes to build cars, trucks, and airplanes, goes to manufacture parking garages, <coughs> goes to build roads, goes to build bridges. Um, it goes to the ecological footprint of transportation. Um, and this is, this is just one examination of the, just the greenhouse gas emissions from transportation in Canada. Um, it was done by the government of Quebec uh, through um, Quebec Hydro. And what they show is what people normally talk about for greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. It's just what comes out the tailpipe. About, 30, about a third of Canadian emissions come out of the tailpipes of our cars, trucks, and airplanes. But if you add up all the other bits, including that natural gas, that fracking gas that goes into the tar sands, um, the emissions from refineries, the roads, the bridges, the multi-level uh, parkades that are being built for our cars and trucks, it's over half of our energy-related greenhouse gas emissions. So we've got a problem that threatens our, our well-being, that threatens our the survival of our species, actually. And close to half of that problem in Canada is just is driven by just how by how we get around. So we can't deal with the tar sands, we can't deal with fracking without dealing with transportation. It's just an impossibility. But it actually wasn't very long ago that most of us got around by walking, bicycles, and electric public transit, uh, in the cities at least. Um, up until the, the end of World War II, Canadian cities were largely dominated by streetcars. Um, this is uh, downtown Vancouver. Showing it, that's actually not a streetcar, that's an interurban car that uh, a larger commuter or um, multi purpose train, electric train, those used to run out to, uh, to Richmond, used to run out to Coquitlam, they used to run uh, out through New Westminster, through Surrey, well out into the Fraser Valley, up until the mid 1950s. So we actually have cities that were built around public transit. They weren't built around, most of the, the cores of our cities were not built around the automobile. They weren't built for the automobile. Um, it was only after World War II that really uh, the automobile took hold. And what it was, was really, it was a, it was a reaction, it was, an, it was a system change of what the economy was for and how the economy operated. The automobile was the way of rescuing our economy from, to preventing it from sliding back into depression after the World War II. All our factories were busy, full, full scale production, running overtime shifts, um, producing war machinery, producing trucks, tanks, airplanes, ships. Uh, at the end of the war, when all that stuff was being shut down and people were de being demobilized, um, there was a great fear that we were going to slide back into a Great Depression uh, and that this would be almost like a, a permanent depression. It was, it, there was no way out of it. And capitalist economists came up with a great idea. They had this, they decided that. They could put together a few new things, um, the modern advertising industry, even more importantly, consumer credit, 
and the automobile. And the automobile not as a utilitarian vehicle for, for farmers who really needed one, but as, a, as an object of desire where the fins would be changed every year so that by the time your car was three years old, you would know that it was out of fashion. And that's, this is the age that we live in right now. We're living in that age of where it's seen as a good thing to stimulate the production of automobiles, the consumption of oil, um, production of rubber, all of these things are seen as good things, but we're now in a different, still in, in mainstream discourse, growth in our economy. And that's what growth looks like. It's steel, it's oil. It's seen as a good thing still. But we're, all, we're at a point where that, continuing on that path of more and more consumption is suicidal. And part of the reason that, that it works so well, the, the automobile, um, uh, the stimulus of the economy through the automobile after World War II was that they discovered that they got traffic jams, but every time they built a new road, they would just fill up with new commuters, and no matter how many roads you built, they would always fill up as long as oil was cheap and the economy was growing. And this is actually very well known. You can't build your way out of congestion because people know the history from Toronto, from Los Angeles, from Vancouver, all these cities. What a lot of people don't know is that over and over again, when bridges have fallen down, uh, or freeways have fallen down in earthquakes, or cities have just decided to, to make transit lanes, uh, and take away space from cars, traffic also disappears. It appears and disappears. It's an elastic thing. And this is just, this is the, the framework that we're in, is that we need a transformation of how we get around. And um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about from now on in my presentation is based on this recent Wilderness Committee and Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives report called Transportation Transformation. And there are copies at the back. Um, what we need to do, and what, what's proposed in this report, is just to look at where we came from, a streetcar society where our cities were, were dominated by public transit, to a situation where the automobile dominates our, our cities, our roads, and our economy. And take a look at what's actually driving that. And a lot of it is spending on roads still, like you can see with the Gateway Program here in BC. Uh, provincial government has spent billions of our dollars, well over $5 billion already. Uh, and unless we stop them, they'll find another $5 billion worth of projects to build, of freeway projects to build. <laughs> um, and, but if you think about that money, you know, that is the starting point for, for this report, is, and for the transportation transformation, is look at where the money's going and what it could be, could be done with it instead. And that money that's being spent on freeways is right now paying people to build the South Fraser Perimeter Road, um, the Portman Bridge, the new Portman Bridge, or if you look to Montreal, the Turcotte Interchange, which is even more ridiculous that they're considering rebuilding that. That is the money that's needed for um, our going back to an electric public transit system. That's exactly what we need. Um, and this report suggests that we can get over a billion dollars a year for uh, public transit and for low carbon transportation. And of course the question comes, well, where are you going to put all this transit? We already own the road space. We, we own these roads. And because traffic is, is um, elastic, 
when you do take a few lanes away from cars for, for transit, some of the traffic just disappears. And this is, this is um, uh, another thing that, that points out how much road space there is actually out there. <laughs> it's, it's and we've already got bus lanes on highways all over the place. We've just got our first shoulder. This is our shoulder bus lane from uh, near Ottawa. Um, we've just built the first shoulder bus lanes here in, in um, uh, BC, just out in Richmond and Delta. Um, in urban areas, it's the same thing. You know, our space, our public spaces are being taken up by these devices designed to burn oil to keep our economy growing. And there is really no reason that we should either be stuck in traffic or that we should be donate we should be allowing so much of our public land to be used for doing something that is threatening our society, threatening our civilization, and threatening our species. And if you just take another step forward, you can start to see that transit systems, just by, by shifting a little bit of space over, you can start to get situations where transit is the quickest, most convenient way to get there. Um, and it doesn't have to be that expensive to build. Electric trolley bus rapid transit is something that um, is being done all over the world except for in Canada and is only just being considered in the US. Um, electric vehicles. Um, ben was talking about how much electricity is being used or be proposed to be used by the, the fracking industry. Well, the fact is an electric assist bicycle is a very efficient device. Uh, an electric scooter is uses a very small amount of power while giving the kind of mobility that people really need. And you don't have to buy a $40,000 car to run a, ride an electric vehicle if there's electric taxis. Um, but of course, to get away from the automobile, people need to travel around the province, around the region, as well as just in their cities. That's where we need electric trains and long distance buses. Freight? The biggest problem we have with freight right now is the amount of coal. That's, that's one of the, the main reasons that's being used that we can't have passenger rail. There's too much track time being used for coal, and so we can't have passenger trains getting in the way. So it's reducing the amount of goods that we use is a first step, but also just shifting to the efficient modes that have been around for decades. We're already using barging on the Fraser River, which is about 10 times as efficient as trucking. Almost everywhere in the world now has electric freight trains, except North America. Um, and you know, when we're in a province with, as Ben was talking about, all this hydroelectric power. So what I would like to put forward is that if we're going to really get the system changed we need, we need an involved population but also a really informed um, population who know what the alternatives are and know that, um, that there are affordable, doable alternatives and that we can turn our society around. Thank you very much.